it, it was very difficult um, because like, when I got my second sentence, I actually thought that is all I'm going to do for the rest of my life um, is crime. Because you know they don't want to give, when you're a criminal, people don't want to give you a chance. Uh, and sometimes I do not ever judge anyone. You don't know why people have got into crime in the first place. So don't ever judge no one until you've walked in their shoes. So my reason that I went to prison in the first place is because my mom and dad went back to Jamaica when I was 17. And I was left in England because I always wanted to play football. But I start, I got into the, the wrong things, obviously ended up there. And then um, the changing point was um, someone, the prison officer, believed in me. And for him to let me out every weekend to play for semi pro side, if it went wrong, he would have lost his job. Right? So for him to have that belief in me, that gave me the belief in myself that I could do this. But, and f for me, football saved my life. The VAR Show. The one place for your weekly football update. Very warm welcome to the VAR show, the show which talks about all the various major football leagues in detail. Today we are going to continue with interviews and we have Mr. Jamie Lawrence with us. So, Jamie has played for the likes of Leicester City, Sunderland, Bradford to name a few and he has also represented Jamaica at international stage multiple times in early 2000s. So, without wasting much time, I would like to first thank Jamie for coming on the show. Thank you and welcome to the show. And I would like to begin by asking you, how are you and what are you doing these days? Um, I'm not too bad, thank you. Um, what I do now, I do a lot of strength and conditioning with a lot of top footballers. I coach them outside of their clubs. A lot of them come like from Chelsea, other clubs around the country to, to get in physical condition. And um, I do a lot of things with disadvantaged kids, boys who are at risk of offending, doing bad things. I do a lot of work with them and try and keep them on the straight and narrow. And I go into a lot of prisons and do workshops. Of course, Anil, like uh, you have been involved in this uh, particular uh, field for quite a while. You know, after your playing career, maybe in the fitness part. And how have you had to adapt yourself? You know, because of the pandemic. Well, um, at, the, at the beginning, it was hard because um, you can't train no one. But then I found a way where I've been going online now and doing Zoom sessions with people and I'm doing Instagram sessions with people and it's helped me because I can reach um, a wider, wider audience now. I've got people in France, I've got people in America, I've got people all over. So it's, it's helped me, I've had to adapt, but it's, it's been good. Of course, and you know, like I'll talk of your career, playing career uh, now and you know, like you've had a very unusual career, you know, like from from your dark days when you had when you went to prison to you know going to going on to represent multiple clubs in England you know like uh, top level clubs how do you look back at your journey? Sometimes I've got to pinch myself and and say listen I can't believe that I actually achieved that from where I was I was rock bottom um, in prison I, I was in prison for three years two months out of seven year sentence. But then in, in life, I always say to people that you don't know what's around the corner, right? So you, you should never, ever give up in life. So on my second sentence, when I was doing my four-year sentence, that turned out to be my salvation, where a prison officer saw that I had talent and we played against a semi-professional team um, and I scored two goals against this team. And then the team asked the prison officer if I could play for them. So after I had done um, one year, four months, they started letting me out every weekend to play for a semi-professional team. And then the um, team started watching me. Um, I got released after doing two years, two months of that sentence. Then I went on trial at Sunderland after three other failed trials, which was another thing I could have given up after the three failed trials. Then I went to Sunderland. 
and I signed at Sunderland and I never looked back. I ended up playing in the Premier League and um, playing for my country as well. So I'm the only person to have ever done it before me and after. No one's ever done it since. I'm the only person to have done it. So that's I always say to people, live your own dream and always believe that you can change. Of course, and you know, like uh, in hindsight, it is easy, you know, to say like your story. It sounds very fairy tale esque, you know, like but for you personally, it would have been very difficult. Yeah. Like you know, like coming out from there, maybe you didn't know what to do, and like you said, you pinch yourself even now that you had a career like that. How difficult was it for you, you know, like to maybe get the chance, you know, to uh, maybe have someone believe in you? It was very difficult um, because like. Uh, when I got my second sentence, I actually thought that it's all I'm going to do for the rest of my life um, is crime. Because you know they don't want to give, when you're a criminal, people don't want to give you a chance. Uh, and sometimes I do not ever judge anyone. You don't know why people have got into crime in the first place. So don't ever judge no one until you've walked in their shoes. So my reason that I went to prison in the first place is because my mom and dad went back to Jamaica when I was 17 and I was left in England because I always wanted to play football but I start, I got into the, the wrong things obviously ended up there and then um, the changing point was um, someone, the prison officer believed in me and for him to let me out every weekend to play for semi-pro side if it went wrong he would have lost his job All right? So for him to have that belief in me, that gave me the belief in myself that I could do this. But and for, for me, football saved my life. Of course, and you know, like uh, another thing that I wanted to talk about was like you know, like you have been vocal like in the past that you have revealed how you encountered racism and how I wanted to ask like how did you deal with it? You know, from from when I was young. I had racism from the area I come from because there's only five black families. Uh, but my mom, God bless her soul, she's gone now. She passed away nearly two years from now. And she taught me how to, to be tough. Like, if I came indoors and I was crying, getting bullied by the other, she used to walk me out and make me fight. Said, what am I feeding you for? And make me fight. So in the end, they never... They weren't racially abusing us, but I see racism all the time. In football, there's a lot of it, but they've become more clever in doing it now. Where they won't give you certain jobs. They won't come out and blatantly say racist comments. But it's like, if you look at the Premier League now, there's 30% black players at least. Yeah? How many made that transition to management? How many black managers have you got in the Premier League? How many man black managers have you got in the whole leagues in England? Not very many. So that's that's the racism, institutional racism. I prefer someone to come out and say something to me, but to give me not to give me a job because of the colour of my skin is is not good. Of course, and you know, like that's a very uh, that topic has been raised again and again. You know, like uh, in the in the recent past, and that's something maybe. Clubs and as a institution, as a society itself, they have to look, ponder upon and maybe find a solution. You know, like going forward, educate the people, whatever. Like you know, like I wanted to ask you, like you know, like many people in their day-to-day -day life, they face discrimination in various ways, like you said, and yeah, in the, all the fields, not only football or any sport. Like since you have been yeah. through something like that, if you had to give a piece of advice to that person, what would you say, like to that person? To keep going, right? To always keep going, keep believing, right? But my thing is, I've always said it, I do not want a job because of the color of my skin, right? I need to be able to do the job, right? Because for me, if I go into a job and I can't do the job, it closes the door behind me for the other people coming through, right? And this is the thing like being on time, being able to do your job being professional all those things have manners and respect for everyone around you but that's the only way it's going to change if we keep going like i will never give up right? 
like me playing football, that was a dream. Now my next dream, I, I'm I'm training top players, right? So I never give up. Not because of the colour of my skin, I never give up. I'm a fighter and I'll fight until the end. And if you keep doing what you're doing, you can change it for other people behind you. Of course, and you know, like I'll get to a more lighter topic than this uh, very little bit more. Mm -hmm. Competitive uh, series, you uh -huh. know, like uh, you spoke about, like you, uh, your next is to train people, and you know, it's very different when you, like you said, you take Zoom classes or Instagram. It's very different when you do that compared to maybe face to face. How have you had to change your program, like in terms of uh, the fitness, everything that in comparison because of the pandemic, also, like you know, like people are locked up in their house. How have you had to evolve yourself? You know what? Um, I've always been one where. I train with most of my clients. So I do that now on Zoom or I do it on Instagram. And I'm more of a leader. So if I do it, they will follow. Right. And I'm 50 and I can do it. So I've got a good following on there. And because they see me doing it all the time, they follow me. So I've not really had to adapt anything. All right. I just, my leadership qualities will come out and they always have come out. So I'm not really had to adapt to it. Of course, and you like, after your playing career, you also uh, were involved in coaching. Is that, was that something you always planned or was it something that happened spontaneous? It happened spontaneously. I never, I never ever thought that I would be a coach. Right? And I, and I would work with Ghana for two African nations. I never thought I would be a coach. But when I finished football, I never knew what I was going to do. It was a hard time for me, which the dark times came back where I knew I thought maybe I'll go back to what I used to do because obviously I wasn't one of them big players who earned all this money, but I played in the Premier League. But I then went and got personal training. Then I started working with this young kids coaching them I had my own I got my own football academy and I realised that I was a good coach and I've had a lot of players who have come through me and go into the professional game uh, so I love that side of it and I, I love seeing people improve not only in football but as a person Of course and you're like uh, are, you, are you still coaching right now? I coach, I do my own stuff with in my football academy and I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff which is all about mentality. Yeah. Officer, do you plan to go back to maybe a team or coaching or something? You know what, like, if it's a big team, I will go. But because I do all the stuff and I'm my own boss, I like, I like being my own boss and I help the kids in the inner city and that's that's bigger than anything when you're when you're helping saving lives and you're making people better people i think that's more rewarding than being at any club of course and uh you know like it's been a while since you played football you know it was quite a while back you played and you have retired so how in your opinion since you have been continuously in in touch with the game in various aspects maybe coach or like maybe you said training or maybe youth, how has the game changed, you know, in your opinion? I, I don't think the players is, are as good as when we played. Um, pitchers are nicer, they're not as fit. They look fitter, but they're not as fit. Um, quick, but for me, the game's gone soft. You can't even tackle no more. People rolling around everywhere. But, Listen, I love the game still. I always will love the game. But I preferred to play when I played. Uh, There's a lot, lot better players. If you if you look at the Premiership back in the day, to the Premiership now, you could probably name 20 world-class players when I played, at least. Now, how many could you name in the Premier League? It just says it all for me. Uh, the standard gone down a little bit, but Premier League's the biggest league in the world, though. Of course, it's especially like one, if Messi comes here. Yeah, that's also another topic. That's uh, you know, like it can be discussed again and again. You never know. 
whether he can do yeah. it on a cold night on in Stoke. Yeah, that's or Burnley, Burnley. Yeah. Okay, now but yeah, I it's think Burnley. He yeah. He's got that desire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. And you're like uh, just staying with similar like you spoke about uh, 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 back in your day how tough it was even you know like for players and how more more physical it was. For you, if you had to name one defender or an opponent in general, who was the most toughest you played against? Who would that be? The, yeah, but my toughest was not as in physical. The, t- the player who gave me the toughest time of my career was a, a player called Tony Dorigo. He's a left back, but he wasn't physical. When it, when it was physical, it was easier for me because I was a physical player. Right? But he was very clever. Uh, and he gave me the hardest time of my career, but as in life, in your darkest days, this is how you learn. Uh, so after that day, I went back to the drawing board and I, I learned. So you can't play like this all the time. You have to learn new tricks, and that's what I've done. But people forget, like when I came into football, I had never been coached before. So I was learning on the job. Uh, at 23, I'd never been coached. So. It was just raw ability what got me through the door and, and gave me a 12-year career. Of course, and you like you said, like 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 I mentioned earlier, like you played for many top teams in England, and this will be a difficult question for you. If you had to choose one team where you enjoyed your time the most, which one would that be? It's not difficult. It's Bradford City. Right? Bradford City is my favourite club. I still go back now. Um, I spent six good years there, and the people, the fans. They made me feel so welcome. It's like a family club. I had the best time there. Of course, and you're like uh, just before the interview, I was seeing your goals. I think it was the year 2000. You scored against West Ham. I think you scored two. And if you had, if, if I, yeah. if I were to ask you, like, uh, which is the best goal that you scored? As in, like, you go back home and you watch again and again. Which one is that? Do you have any? Um, I have one where I scored against Norwich, where. I was in the middle of our half. I took on four four players and slotted it. That was one of my best. Um, West Ham game was one of them. But um, I think my favourite goal I scored was against Gillingham. It was 35 yards and I chipped the keeper. I saw him off his line and I chipped the keeper. I think that was probably my best goal. And then um, my only goal for Jamaica will always be special because scoring for your country, nothing can be that. Of course, and you're like talking of Jamaica, you know, like uh, you were playing in Premier League then, you know, which was like, I think back then also it was one of the most uh, toughest and the most watched all over the world. And going back and maybe playing to Jamaica, which probably was not developed as much in terms of football in comparison to Premier League. How was it playing there? How was the football there when you used to go and play for the national team? So people don't realize Jamaica had some really, really good players, players who were playing in the Premier League. Right. And even the Jamaican players were really, really good. So at first I was thinking, oh, they're not going to be up to standard, but really, really good standard. And we played very good teams like Mexico, America, Honduras, Costa Rica. So was a tough game, but the football was very, very good, very, very physical. And obviously the pitches weren't as good and it was always hot. So it made it a little bit hard for some of us. But I, I enjoyed my experience in playing for Jamaica. And the players are still good friends with them now. And the players are top draw. They're very good players. Of course, you like, I want to ask, like, how is the footballing culture there? How is the fanfare? And how is the. Do, do you have a lot of people coming over to watch games? What, in Jamaica? Yeah. Yes. But when Jamaica play, the whole, whole of Jamaica is locked down. Right, the fans are everywhere. It's always packed. They love it, and they're in every bar. A, oh, they they love football in Jamaica, especially when they're doing well. Everyone comes out. Of course, actually, what I meant to ask was like, was, is it the first sport, or do you have another sport which is more popular than football? There. No, no, um, football and athletics. Athletics, obviously, with you saying, is probably as popular, but football is the biggest sport in Jamaica. Of course, and you're like uh, coming back to you, and you're like, if you had to choose one person or a coach who had the most influence in your career, who would that be? 
Um, most influence. Best manager, Martin O'Neill. Um, probably there's two people biggest influence, Paul Jewell and a manager called Sammy Chung. Massive. And then obviously the prison officer. Of course. Uh, he was a big influence on me. Of course, and maybe and uh, because he took the risk, you are here what you are today. Yeah, yes. If he never took that risk, I wouldn't be here talking about my career. Of course, and you know, like, uh, I wanted to ask you, like, of course, everyone asks you, like, uh, generally asks which is your favorite win or something on that notes. I would like, I would like to, like, shift the question and ask you, like, which was the most devastating loss in your career? You know, as a whole, any game that you thought when you lost, you were very sad or something. I was quite, I was quite lucky that when all the big games come up, we we won most of them. But our uh, one to get relegated, um, Grimsby against I think it was Tranmere. We lost Grimsby against Tranmere. Uh, I'd only gone there for six weeks. It, we had to win or draw to stay up, and we got beat. That was uh, probably the most devastating loss. Of course, and you know, like uh, moving on from that, I want to ask you, like, were you a superstitious person when you were playing? Like, would you follow some certain routines before games? Nah, I, I wasn't superstitious. Um, yeah, all, a lot of the boys are superstitious. I was never superstitious. The only thing I would do different, I would, I would eat at eight o'clock in the morning. I would eat breakfast, and I wouldn't eat until after the game. Of course, like you know, like uh, uh, this, this the next question might be very rudimental, and you know, like it might be very, very, uh, maybe, maybe even it's a very, very foolish question. But I wanted to ask you, like, wh what does football mean to you? <laughs> well, I said earlier, football saved my life. So I owe football, I owe football a lot, and I still haven't lost the love for football. I still play for a vet side. I played in a charity game on um, Saturday and I've still got the same enthusiasm I did as a kid. I want to win, running around the place and I just love the game. Of course, and you're like, uh, I'll ask you, like, we are getting to the end and I'll ask you two more questions and the uh, first one of the two being like, if you had to choose one moment from your career, which is the most standout moment for you, which one would that be? Right. Um, first one, Bradford City had never been in the Premier League and we had to beat Wolves away and they needed to beat us to get into the playoffs and we beat them 3-2 to go up into the Premier League and, oh, the first time in their history and then the second and then the next season we had to beat Liverpool to stay up and they had to beat us to go into the Champions League and we ended up beating them 1-0 which is like for Bradford City winning it's like winning the Champions League. Of course, and like, two stand up moments. Of course. So even like what do you think of Bradford City? Do you think do you see them coming to the Premier League anytime soon? I hope so. Um we've got a good manager there now, my ex teammate, Stuart McCall. Anything's possible. It's all about momentum. Getting the right players on board, getting the players working together, anything's possible. You know? It's a big club, big city, and I just love, I love the club. Of course, and you like on that note, I'll ask you one final question. And uh, you know, like you've had so much experience, you know, highs and lows. And if you had to give a piece of advice yeah. to an upcoming player who's just starting out his or her career, what advice would you give that player? I always give the same advice to anyone. Be the best version of yourself every day. That means working hard, right? And never settling for anything, right? Just trying to raise the bar every single day. Because a lot of people, the reason they don't succeed is that they get comfortable, right? Always try and improve, right? Like some, sometimes it might not work out, but always try and improve. Always have that work ethic when you want to be better than anyone else, right? Don't don't follow people and make some sacrifices. Look, you all you have to do is look at 
Ronaldo's and the Messi's of this world and see how hard they work. And it was no no accident that they were at the top of their game. Of course, Anil, like, uh, so before we wind up, I'll sneak in another question. If you had to choose one of these two, whom would you choose, Ronaldo or Messi? Messi. I'm a Messi man. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll respect Ronaldo. I respect him a lot. But I'm just a, um, a Messi man because I think he's more unselfish as a team teammate. And hope to see him on, in the Premier League soon, if that's possible. You never know. You never know. Hopefully, he'll be back at Ebi in the Premier League. And then we'll see what he's made of. Hopefully. And you're like, on that note, Jamie, thank you so much for talking to me. And I wish you all the best for your endeavors. No whatever you do. Hope you can succeed in that mm-hmm. also, like how you uh, succeeded in your playing career. And hope you can talk in soon. Take care. Stay safe. Bye. You too. Take care. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye.